Okay, um, I am starting. Uh, hopefully this is going live on the uh, Facebook page uh, for New Jersey uh, Pelvic Pain Healing Institute. Uh, I'm Dr. Patrick Foy, I'm an MD or medical doctor. I'm the director of the Coccyx Pain Center or Tailbone Pain Center uh, here in uh, New Jersey, in uh, Newark, New Jersey. And I wanna thank uh, the uh, group for inviting me uh, and I thank uh, Zarina for her uh, very kind words uh, at the uh, start. Um, right now, I'm just refreshing my page here. I have a computer behind my iPhone to see if uh, it looks like I'm uh, going live there, which is a good thing. Uh, so, uh, so basically, um, what I would ask people to do is to post your comments down below. If you have uh, questions uh, about uh, coccyx pain, uh, tailbone pain, uh, things of that nature, how that interacts with uh, other pelvic floor problems uh, and such. Uh, as uh, Zarina mentioned, uh, I practice uh, here in New Jersey uh, and I definitely have a profound respect for uh, pelvic floor physical therapists. Uh, a good pelvic floor PT is uh, certainly worth their weight in gold uh, to patients who are in pain, who are suffering uh, with a wide variety of um, pelvic floor conditions. Uh, and what I do on my side, I'm a um, physical medicine and rehabilitation doc at PMDR. I'm a professor here at uh, Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. Uh, I do all outpatient musculoskeletal medicine, pain management. Uh, I do a lot of um, diagnostic testing and, uh, and uh, treatment. Um, predominantly for patients with tailbone pain has become the, the focus of my practice uh, over the years. Um, so if someone can comment down below and just let me know that, uh, that, that uh, they can see this okay and that they can hear me okay, uh, and if not, uh, let me know so I can tweak uh, whatever I might need to uh, tweak on the uh, technical issues. And um, Okay, I got a hello there. So someone, oh, you're all good. Okay, terrific. Um, so if, um, if folks want to um, post their comments down below, uh, I'd be happy to uh, you know, just uh, share some educational perspectives with you uh, with the usual disclaimer that, of course, this session is educational. It's not, uh, you know, uh, individual medical advice for any uh, particular person to follow, but rather um, bringing up topics that can be uh, good to share uh, with your, uh, you know, in-person treating uh, healthcare prof uh, professional. Um, so again, thank you uh, to, um, to those who have uh, invited me to uh, to uh, join for the uh, session here. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and, um, and again, post your comments down below. In the meantime, I'll just, uh, you, know, you know, brainstorm and chat a bit about uh, tailbone pain. Uh, as I said, I am a professor here at the medical school. Um, I have written a 272-page um, a book uh, all about the, uh, nothing but the tailbone. Um, so if you get me started, I could keep going for a long time, uh, basically until my iPhone battery runs out, uh, talking about uh, coccyx pain. Uh, so uh, I see one of the questions here uh, says, can your tailbone not itself be painful, but, it be, but it can it be causing pain in other areas such as perineum pain? Um, that's a terrific question. Um, a lot of times there's a little bit of a uh, chicken and the egg phenomenon. And what I mean by that is that uh, some patients will have, uh, will have tailbone pain, uh, and, uh, and basically uh, what, will, uh, what will happen is that uh, from their tailbone, uh, they will have pain that is referred to other areas uh, or that uh, other adjacent areas that become painful as well. Um, so for example, you know, here we have a, uh, an anatomic uh, model of the pelvis. Uh, and, uh, and basically uh, you know, what we can see if I you know, hold it this way, so I'm basically looking, uh, looking through the pelvis here, um, you can see how the tailbone uh, is you know, sticking up uh, right here at the, uh, at the back uh, of the pelvis. Uh, and there's a lot of muscular attachments that happen. Uh, so, uh, so basically, you can think of the pelvic floor as being a large you know, sort of sling or trampoline uh, or a hammock, uh, so to speak. Um, and the attachments in the front, uh, you know, some of them are here on the pubic bone. And the attachments on the back, uh, some of those are here on the sacrum and coccyx. Um, so one of the things that can happen is that when the tailbone is painful, um, whether that's because of a dislocation, uh, a bone spur, arthritis, uh, dynamic instability, which we can talk about, um, lots of you know, other things that can cause pain at the tailbone, just as things can cause pain in other joints uh, and musculoskeletal problems throughout the uh, body. Um, when those areas are painful, 
the, the muscles in that area can go into spasm as well. Um, just like the same way that if I fractured my wrist, I would start to go into this guarding mode where my shoulder and my upper arm would sort of clench into my torso, and then I would start to get muscle soreness and aching throughout these other areas. So similarly, when there's pain at the coccyx, people can start to have a lot of muscle spasm throughout the pelvic floor. Um, and that's really where a uh, skilled pelvic floor physical therapist can be immensely valuable uh, at helping to, to uh, work on those painful areas you know, within the pelvic floor. <clears throat> Um, and meanwhile, in my practice, I'm, uh, I'm treating uh, a lot of the pain at the coccyx. Um, but it, there is, as I said before, it, it, there is a little bit of a chicken and an egg phenomenon because, as I just said, there's times when people can have tailbone pain and then they get a lot of pelvic floor muscle spasm. So that started out a problem at the tailbone and now they have pain and, and muscle spasm and tightness throughout the pelvic floor. They can have um, you know, pain with, uh, with uh, bowel movements. The, the rectum, as you know, is, a, is basically a, 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 a muscular tube. The bladder up in the front is basically a muscular sac. Uh, so as muscle spasm happens throughout the pelvis, people can start to get bowel and bladder uh, you know, dysfunction and things along those lines. Um, in, you know, secondary to what started out as an isolated tailbone problem. Now the chicken and the egg part of it is that the, the reverse can also happen to some extent. People can have pelvic floor problems and as the pelvic floor muscles are, uh, are tight and spasmed and they may be uh, you know, asymmetric uh, where one side the muscles are short and tight and at the other side the muscles may be a little bit weaker and looser. Um, those are causing mechanical forces onto the tailbone where those attachment sites occur. And therefore, what you can have is a situation where something started out as predominantly a pelvic floor problem, and now they're having, uh, the patient may be having tailbone pain uh, in addition to that. Um, so that's uh, some of the back and forth between uh, problems at the pelvic floor and in the perineum, which is basically the area from the anus up to the uh, external genitalia uh, along that pelvic floor. Uh, let me see another question here. Um, is this common with PN? So by PN, people are typically in the pelvis, uh, they're referring to pudendal neuralgia. Um, and the pudendal nerve uh, basically comes off uh, from the sacrum. Let me see, in this model, it doesn't show it uh, quite as well. I'm looking to see if the other model shows it a little better. But, so, so basically from the, from the back of the sacrum here, um, you can see where the, uh, you know, where these sacral nerve roots are exiting. Um, and sacral nerve roots, you know, number, you know, two, three, and four uh, make up with the pudendal nerve. So those three nerve roots come out on the right and also over on the left. And on each side, they form the pudendal nerve. And then that pudendal nerve swings back this way. Let me find a uh, pointer here. Um, the pudendal nerve swings over here to what's called the ischial spine, which is this little, uh, you know, area that sticks out uh, along the ischium here at the back of the pelvis. Um, and the pudendal nerve sort of drapes just external to the ischial spine, and then it swings down uh, you know, uh, and forward uh, in what's called Alcox Canal. Um, and that's the spot where a pudendal nerve, uh, the most common time physicians think about pudendal nerve and pudendal nerve blocks uh, is when a woman is in uh, labor and delivery during childbirth, uh, and at that time, a pudendal nerve block is a, is a way of providing some anesthesia locally. Uh, so the OBGYN, for example, will, uh, will uh, insert a needle from inside the vagina and basically right along uh, this area here within the bone. And they'll put a couple of milliliters of local anesthetic to block the, uh, you know, the pudendal nerve because the pudendal nerve carries a lot of sensation from the area of the external genitalia. Uh, and particularly if a patient is going to have an episiotomy, uh, which is where the uh, obstetrician or gynecologist will uh, be doing a controlled cut uh, of the tissue in that area to allow for more space for the, you know, for the head uh, and shoulders of the baby uh, to exit. Uh, during uh, labor and delivery, uh, doing the pudendal nerve block will help to block that. Now, back to the question at hand, which is, um, with pudendal neuropathy, one of the things that happens is that people get pain in that distribution of the pudendal nerve. Um, and that can be very, very uh, problematic for patients uh, to have pain in the perineum or the, and in the genital region. Um, usually it's one side worse than the other, although some patients can have it bilaterally, meaning on both sides. Um, and 
There are things that can be done for uh, pudendal nerve pain, as, uh, as uh, hopefully members of this group are, are aware of. I know that there, uh, there was a uh, guest speaker on here uh, within the last uh, few weeks or month uh, who was speaking about uh, pudendal neuropathy and pudendal neuralgia, which um, neuropathy just means it's a nerve problem. Uh, neuralgia means that it's a painful nerve. Um, so pain within that pudendal nerve distribution. Again, think about the external genitalia as a you know as a starting point um, on on one side you know uh, rather than the other. Um, and basically, then uh, there are things that can be done for that, both in terms of pelvic floor physical therapy, uh, also in terms of injections, uh, and in a small percentage of patients, uh, surgery. All right. So let me just go back and see if uh, what other questions have come in here uh, for me in the meantime. Uh, someone says, okay, uh, let's see. I've been told that my tailbone kind of curves to one side. How bad is this? Um, well, it really depends on whether it's significantly symptomatic or not. Um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, things that may be normal anatomic variation uh, from, you know, from one person to the other. Uh, so for example, um, Somebody's right-handed, somebody's left-handed. Somebody has a little bit more range of motion in internal or external rotation at one shoulder compared with the other shoulder. One leg may be slightly uh, longer than the other. Um, so some of those variations might not be causing problems, but sometimes they certainly can, or they can be a signal of an underlying problem. So it's always a matter of having your uh, healthcare provider, your physician or pelvic floor physical therapist, uh, or whatever healthcare provider you're seeing, put, the, put those kinds of findings into the context of what's going on in an individual patient. Um, I had a patient just this past week where uh, the previous MRI studies had been read as being totally normal, uh, but uh, when he came in and saw me, um, we saw that he actually had uh, the lower part of his coccyx um, was actually dislocated laterally, meaning it had gone off to one side. Uh, and the uh, MRI uh, radiologist, unfortunately, had missed it. Uh, MRI takes images in slices, one slice at a time. So any given slice sort of looked okay, but when you, you know, kind of reconstructed them three-dimensionally in your mind's eye, you could see that there was a slice where the lower tailbone was not included, and then the next slice over where that lower tailbone was present. And basically, in that case, it was a laterally displaced or laterally dislocated um, lower bone of the coccyx. And we were able to uh, see that on his uh, x-rays. It was a good example where um, properly done x-rays were able to show, in that case, more actually uh, than the MRI had shown, even though MRI is a terrific uh, you know, high-tech study and, and uh, very expensive. Uh, in his case, and in many cases, uh, properly done x-rays sometimes can, po can, um, you know, can reveal um, better findings in terms of uh, diagnosis of the coccyx. Um, if the tailbone is off to one side, again, then it's a matter of looking, uh, is there a reason for that? Is it mechanically displaced from a musculoskeletal perspective? Is it that the pelvic floor has more tightness you know, on, on one side versus the other? Uh, and again, uh, someplace where you know, we can work hand in hand with uh, a good pelvic floor physical therapist. Uh, can a curved coccyx contribute to pelvic pain and is there a way to correct it? Um, again, it's a matter of putting it into the clinical context of what's going on with a given patient. Um, so sometimes, let me get this model, which will show this a little bit better. Um, so this one is basically just showing the, the lumbar spine, the sacrum, and the coccyx without showing the rest of the pelvis. Um, but it allows you to see if you look from the, you know, from the side here, um, if in some cases the coccyx can be very abruptly uh, angled forward. So it can make uh, kind of like a 90 degree angle, you know, right, for example, at the sacrococcygeal joint where the sacrum meets the coccyx. In those cases, the coccyx is sort of sticking in the way of the rectum. Uh, so some of those patients will have pain with bowel movements. They'll have, have a lot of rectal muscle spasm. Uh, they can have, um, you know, pain, you know, within you know, the... Uh, you know, some of the muscles in the area, you know, puborectalis, et cetera. Um, and in those cases, certainly a forward flex coccyx may contribute to uh, other uh, you know, areas of pelvic pain. Um, and then the question is, is there a way to uh, reverse this? Well, it may be possible, uh, it, you know, with uh, gentle stretching techniques and, uh, and, and uh, helping to relax some of the muscle groups in that area, um, to relax some of the stresses that are pulling the coccyx forward. Um, it may also be possible to uh, gently, you know, stretch the coccyx 
pulling it, um, pulling it somewhat back into a more neutral position. Um, being cautious, of course, uh, anytime the healthcare provider is doing this um, to make sure that you're not causing a flare-up or exacerbation of the pain. Um, so again, it's a matter of um, looking at uh, the individual patient and figuring out what makes the most sense. Uh, someone's asking if there is a way to privately send questions, and I will um, I will defer to the um, uh, to the moderators here. Maybe through um, maybe through ProTouch Physical Therapy as a as a private message. I really I I almost uh, never am on um, Facebook Private Messenger, um, so um, you wouldn't be able to get them through to me. But if uh, but if uh, maybe if um, Zarina uh, has a way to uh, to take those. Um, that would be one. That would be one option. Uh, let's see. There's a que there's a um, and in general, by the way, I typically I won't read the names as I'm reading these, just because I don't know where this. You know, if the video is in another format, at least uh, you know the names of whoever's asking won't be um, you know won't be included there. Um, sorry, I was just swiping a text message that popped up on my screen. Um, but at any rate, uh, there is a question here that says, um, do you find uh, if an unstable coccyx for multiple fractures sometimes requires removal um, if medical treatment is exhausted? Um, and I would say that in some cases that is the, that is the case, that surgical removal or amputation of the coccyx is required. Uh, fortunately, it is a very small percentage of uh, patients with um, coccydinia, with tailbone pain, um, that will actually need um, that will actually need surgical removal. Um, I would say in my practice, it's made. You know, I've seen a few thousand patients with uh, coccydinia over the last uh, twenty some years, um, and I would say it's maybe one out of every forty or fifty, uh, and and that's at a coccyx pain center here, where where basically I'm inheriting patients who've tried, you know, often um, you know years of treatment uh, prior to coming here. Um, and even with that, most patients, uh, most patients do well without surgical management. And yet there are some who require surgery. And, and I like to make sure that as a non-surgeon that I'm not painting surgery with such a negative brush that, um, you know, that people think they should never have surgery. There are absolutely patients who, uh, for whom surgery is the, um, you know, is uh, the best option or a medically reasonable option. Um, if they've had a true trial of um, adequate non-surgical treatment. Um, the biggest thing I find, though, is that often um, no specific diagnosis was made. Uh, the patient was um, you know, just given a label of coccydinia, which really just means tailbone pain, um, without a specific diagnosis. It would be like saying, you know, if I told you right now, you know, if I was having chest pain. Um, if I was having chest pain right now, you'd say, okay, well, Dr. Foy, you know, you better find out what's causing that chest pain because if it is, you know, coming from my heart, that would be one problem. If it was coming from a pulled muscle, you know, that would be another. If it was a fractured rib, if it was indigestion, everything would be different, of course. Um, and uh, sometimes what I find is that patients are given a label of coccydinia without a specific diagnosis, um, and then they fail to get better, but the, but the treatment that they had was never tailored to the individual patient because a, an individual diagnosis was not made. Um, so, uh, for example, I know that uh, Zarina mentioned it in the, um, in the other uh, intro, but I think it's uh, separate from this video. Um, you know, my book on tailbone pain on Amazon um, is free for today and tomorrow, so May 7th and 8th, uh, 2019. Um, the ebook version is free. Um, just, you know, it'll just click on, you know, you can get the paperback as well if you want to, uh, if you want to buy the paperback version, um, but you can buy, you can, uh, you can get the uh, ebook for free. Um, but my point that I wanted to make was that the first half of the book is all about diagnosis of, uh, of tailbone pain and, and uh, all the different types of things, you know, that can be causing uh, tailbone pain. Um, so hopefully you can read some of them here. Um, we talk about everything from unstable joints to tailbone fractures, dislocations, bone spurs, um, arthritis, abnormal positions, uh, sympathetic nervous system problems with it, you know, within the pelvis, cancer at the, uh, at the coccyx, uh, which unfortunately I've seen in a number of patients, um, and medical tests and things along those lines. Um, so that really then, you know, kind of, um, you know, the whole idea about finding the cause of the tailbone pain is really the, the very first step uh, because it is very, very common. Pretty much every day here, uh, I'm seeing patients who have seen, you know, 
you know, many other physicians, uh, they never had a specific diagnosis made. They had an injection done up at the sacrococcygeal joint, um, and yet their problem was at the opposite end of the coccyx, meaning, you know, they had their injection, you know, let's say, you know, their injection was done, you know, up here, uh, but their problem was down here at the opposite end of the coccyx from a bone spur or a distal dislocation or something along those lines. Um, so, um, so it's really important that a specific diagnosis can, uh, can be made. And typically for the coccyx, the, um, you know, the gold standard for that is to do sitting versus standing x-rays, which we can talk more about if people are interested. Um, all right, let me see um, what other uh, comments are on here. Um, what causes pain and spasm uh, on the sit bones? Um, so basically here, um, I'm going to go back to our uh, anatomic model here. Um, so again, anatomic model of the pelvis, looking from the front, and if we swing around to the back, we can see the sacrum, we can see the coccyx, and when people are referring to the sit bones, um, they're typically referring to, uh, you know, right here at the bottom of the ischium uh, on both sides. Um, and if somebody goes to sit, um, so here somebody's sitting, um, basically you can see that they're putting a lot of their pressure uh, here onto the, uh, onto the sit bones on each side, basically, uh, onto the uh, ischium. And when they have pain there, sometimes it can be something like uh, ischial bursitis. Uh, so a bursa is just a fluid-filled sac, uh, and when it becomes inflamed, we, we add itis, so bursitis. So ischial bursitis can happen uh, at, the, uh, at the base of the ischium uh, on either side. Um, sometimes people uh, with tailbone pain, um, one of the things that will happen is that, uh, you know, you can see here how you know, where, right where my fingers are, if this was the coccyx, you know, sort of sinking into the chair that you're sitting on, uh, then the coccyx is making contact with the, you know, with the, the seat cushion. So one of the things that people will do is they will start to, you know, let me get this right on the, uh, you know, screen, they'll start to lean forwards. Uh, and when they lean forwards, you can see, I'll do the side view here, you can see how then the tailbone is further from the chair, right, further from the seat surface. Um, or they'll start, you know, sitting, leaning towards one side because, again, that takes the pressure off of the tailbone. Um, but one of the things that happens then is that, you know, you start to, you, you started out having tailbone pain. And because the body is smart, it wants to have you lean away, you know, lean forward so you're away from the uh, putting pressure on the coccyx. Or you sit leaning towards one side, you know, or the other. Um, and when you do that for a substantial amount of time, um, you can start to get pain at these other areas. So you start to get ischial pain uh, on either side, uh, for example, or you can get piriformis muscle pain. In fact, I have, a, uh, I have an image in here that'll, that will show uh, some of this. Uh, in the chapter on back and buttock pain, it's an image here, if it'll come out, uh, that shows some of the other areas um, that are often affected uh, along with the uh, along with the coccyx, that so people start to get pain up at their facet joints in the lower back. They get pain at their sacroiliac joints, pain at the piriformis muscle. They may get pain in the anal uh, area, um, and then uh, here, as we were just discussing, uh, kind of that uh, you know area, you know where they get ischial pain down at the bottom. Sometimes they'll also get uh, quote unquote sciatica, which is you know that pain you know, radiating down the leg uh, on either side. Um, and part of that is from, the, uh, is from the issue with the piriformis, that if they're starting to get a lot of piriformis muscle pain on one side or the other, uh, the sciatic nerve goes right underneath the piriformis, and uh, a significant percentage of, time, of the time, the sciatic nerve actually pierces through the piriformis muscle. So when that piriformis muscle, uh, you know, it's one of the uh, buttock muscles, um, is in a lot of spasm, it actually can cause irritation of the sciatic nerve, and because the sciatic nerve goes down into the leg, people will get pain that travels down into the leg. Um, and, and for that point, by the way, it's really, really important um, that the physician uh, or clinician who's treating the patient um, figure out, is the pain coming from the sciatic nerve at the piriformis, or is it coming from, you know, up at the lumbar spine? Um, I cannot tell you how many patients, countless patients who, uh, who have come to see me uh, where they had, um, you know, coccyx pain, piriformis pain, piriformis causing irritation of the sciatic nerve, sciatic nerve shoots pain down the leg, and the physician thinks, oh, that must be coming from a herniated disc up at the lumbar spine causing irritation of the nerve up here. Now, it is true that irritation of the nerve up here at the lumbar spine can cause pain shooting down into the leg. Um, but it's really important that the clinician uh, distinguish between whether the pain is really coming from up at that level versus down at this level. Um, because otherwise what starts to happen is that uh, the patient starts to get 
you know, lumbar epidural injections, but they don't help because that's not where the pain is coming from. Uh, and then when it doesn't help, the physician documents it as the patient failed non-surgical treatment, which implies that they need what? It implies that they need surgical treatment, so then they get a lumbar discectomy or discectomy infusion, and that doesn't help. And then finally, you know, they'll, you know, see a good physical therapist, uh, you know, uh, who, you know, or, uh, you know, rehab medicine physician or other musculoskeletal doc um, that'll look beyond the lumbar spine and realize that it really was coming from, uh, you know, piriformis irritation of the sciatic nerve, in which case maybe they just need a stretching program, local massage, things of that nature, maybe a, a, uh, maybe a local injection or two at the uh, piriformis area, um, but that may do the job uh, for them. All right, so that was the uh, question about uh, pain and spasm at the sit bones. Someone says, um, I sit a lot at work. Uh, can you please recommend a cushion uh, for sitting uh, on chairs uh, and, uh, and toilet seats? Um, so here I would say probably, um, I don't have a specific brand name that I would recommend um, other than that there's you know, lots of them online. The biggest thing I would point out is that um, the, in terms of the cushions, and there's a chapter on this as well, Boy, that opened up right to it. How often has that happened? Uh, so basically within the chapter about cushions for tailbone pain, uh, you can see that there's two, um, two main types. Um, in, uh, the donut cushions uh, typically are not as helpful as the, uh, as the wedge cushions for people with isolated tailbone pain. Um, the donut cushions have a hole in the center, um, and because of that, it has this back wall, uh, that ring of the, uh, of the donut, can push against, you know, can push against the you know, back of the sacrum and coccyx, whereas the wedge cushion basically has that cutout so that, I'm just looking to see if I have one uh, nearby in the office, uh, but basically with that cutout means that the, um, you know, the, the patient puts most of their body weight onto the, uh, sit, the other sit bones, and then there's a cutout so that the tailbone sort of hovers over, you know, over an empty space, so the tailbone is not making so much uh, contact with the seat. Uh, now, interesting. Now, if you go to, um, if you're interested in cushions, by the way, if you go to, um, uh, I have a, a number of articles about uh, coccyx cushions and pudendal nerve cushions uh, on my website, which is www.tailbonedoctor.com forward slash blog b l o g. And then when you go to there, there'll be a, a little um, empty box in the upper right hand corner that's like a little search box. And if you just put in cushion, it'll bring up a number of articles on cushions. And uh, whoever asked this question was asking specifically about toilet seats. And one of the most recent uh, blog posts I did on uh, coccyx cushions was uh, actually uh, a, uh, a video of a toilet seat it was, uh, made into a uh, coccyx cushion. Um, and basically, uh, a number of patients with coccyx pain and also with pudendal nerve pain often will report that they have a, uh, that the most comfortable place for them to sit is when they're sitting on a toilet seat. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, some patients will, you know, go to Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever your you know, local hardware store, uh, and relatively inexpensively, you can buy a toilet seat and then you know, stop at your craft store and put, some, you know, put a little bit of padding and, uh, and fabric on it um, to make it look a little, uh, a little nicer, I guess. Um, but basically then uh, there are patients who will carry around essentially a cushion that's made out of a toilet seat. And one of the, um, one of the most recent um, uh, posts on that blog uh, you know, I have a lot of different articles on there uh, on lots of coccyx uh, and pelvic pain related topics. Um, but one of the most recent ones on there is actually a, you know, a video where I am holding up and showing how somebody uh, made a toilet seat into a cushion. Um, the reason why it's helpful, by the way, I should point out for um, pudendal nerve pain, if you think about that um, toilet seat, what happens with a toilet seat is uh, the toilet seat is kind of where my hands are here around the outside, you know, you know, of this ischial area. Um, and therefore, uh, and uh, we mentioned earlier that the pudendal nerve swings uh, in through here through Alcox Canal. So when you're sitting on a toilet seat, your, uh, your pudendal nerve is not getting pressure directly from the toilet seat. Um, alternatively, if you're sitting on a bicycle seat, that tends to be terrible for people with, uh, with pudendal nerve pain um, because the seat of the bike, instead of it being on the outside like a toilet seat, the bicycle seat basically, you know, is right in here, you know, inside, you know, inside this area, uh, and therefore pressing against that uh, nearby to Alcox Canal, um, which is where that pudendal nerve, uh, you know, uh, travels and can be uh, very irritated there. 
All right, let me uh, scroll down and see what other questions I have here. There is a uh, question about, let's see if I got this one. Um, MRI shows a hooked coccyx. When I sit, put pressure on my tailbone. Feels like my, pre my tailbone is always uh, super tender and uh, aching pain. Um, what can I do? Um, well, the first thing really would be to see, um, especially, um, you know, when uh, most people with tailbone pain will have pr um, pain, as you say, with pressure on that area. In day-to-day -day life, one of the most common sources of pressure on the area um, is when people are sitting, and especially sitting leaning back, leaning, you know, so sitting straight up or slightly back um, tends to be the worst for tailbone pain. Leaning forward, not so bad. Side to side, not so bad. Laying flat, not so bad, because, um, because in that position, uh, in that position when you're laying flat, uh, most of your pressure is on the back of the sacrum and not on the coccyx. Um, for most patients, um, but basically the, um, so the question is, uh, even though the MRI shows this hooked coccyx, um, what becomes really interesting is what happens to the position of that coccyx when you're sitting? Um, and that can be evaluated by sitting versus standing x-rays. Uh, and what's done for that, uh, again, I'll show you an image here uh, that, will, that, will, uh, that will show this, if I can just find it here in the book. Um, so basically what's done is an x-ray is done in the sitting position um, and uh, uh, from the side view. Um, and then we can see what happens in that seated position. Um, because uh, uh, coccygeal uh, instability, where the joints are unstable, is one of the most common causes of tailbone pain. And a, a static MRI or x-ray, you know, where they do the x-ray, you know, or MRI typically while you're either laying down or standing up, um, in some ways doesn't make that much sense because that's not where, you know, that's not the time when the patient has the majority of their pain. Um, I, I've seen hundreds, maybe even into the, uh, into the thousands now probably of patients where uh, the uh, tailbone x-rays or MRI or CT scan that are done while the patient is laying down or standing up look totally fine, the radiologist reads them as normal, the orthopedic uh, you know, surgeon or pain management doc, if they even look at the images, which unfortunately they often do not, um, but if they do, they all think it looks normal. Um, but then we do an x-ray where the person is sitting, um, and again, you know, when they sit and put pressure onto that area, uh, we can see that the tailbone often will go into a significant uh, dislocation, often can go from looking totally normal to being 100% completely dislocated. Um, and uh, that's incredibly helpful information because um, then that tells us exactly which joint is having the problem, um, which then we can give um, individualized treatment for that patient in terms of if they need a local injection, we need to make sure that we cover that specific area for them. Um, unfortunately, very few places in this country um, do the uh, sitting versus standing x-rays. Um, I have trained the radiology technicians uh, in the radiology department uh, you know, here at uh, Rutgers New Jersey Medical School in uh, Newark, uh, part of um, Uni University Hospital here. Um, so you know, that, that's, uh, that's one thing to, uh, to look at if you're not getting adequate um, answers for what's causing your pain from, uh, from other uh, imaging studies. All right, let's see. Um, what are your thoughts on stem cell treatment for pudendal neuralgia? Um, I think that it's, it's an area of um, a lot of interest, and um, I don't know how the research is going to play out on that over time. Um, being in an academic setting, I'm a professor here at the medical school, uh, and we're always trying to teach our um, you know, medical students and resident physicians and uh, those who we train, we're trying to te teach them to, to practice evidence-based medicine um, as best we can where there is evidence available. Um, and the issue really then for, uh, the issue for the stem cell treatment is that it's relatively new. Uh, you know, many insurance companies, uh, you know, most really, you know, uh, would still consider it to be experimental. Uh, and really it's going to be a matter of time will tell whether, whether stem cell treatments are, uh, are a valuable uh, addition to the treatment for pudendal neuralgia and other um, pelvic floor problems. Um, all right, there's another question here. What are the... What are the reasons for a ganglion impar uh, block and the side effects uh, and long-term results? 
So, um, so basically, the, the ganglion impar, ganglion just means like a hub of nerves. Almost think about like a train station where, you know, where all those fibers come together. Um, impar means solitary or unpaired, you know, that most of the sympathetic nervous system ganglia, those nerve hubs, um, are right and left, they, you know, coming down along our spine. But at the coccyx, the very last, uh, you know, sympathetic nerve ganglion in the body in humans is located um, just at the level of the upper coccyx. And there's a single or solitary midline uh, nerve, uh, you know, there. Uh, so that's why they call it, that's how it got its name, ganglion impar. Um, and the reasons why, you know, why, a, uh, where, why an injection there can be helpful, um, and again, I'll try to, uh, you know, I can uh, pull some of this up in here as well, um, is, you know, comes down to uh, the sympathetic nervous system. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system, uh, most of us in, uh, in school uh, have probably learned of the sympathetic nervous system um, kind of as the uh, fight or flight response. Um, so that if a uh, saber-toothed tiger came into the office here right now, um, you know, there would be a fight or flight response. Adrenaline, you know, or epinephrine would be flowing in my veins. My, you know, my heart would start beating faster. My, you know, pupils would get wider. More, more blood flow would go to my muscles. Um, and then I would have, to, I would basically be either going to um, fight or flight. I'm either going to fight off that threat. Um, so I'm going to fight off that saber-toothed tiger, um, or uh, I'm going to do flight. I'm going to, you know, run away, and I'll, I'll need my, you know, my uh, muscle energy and strength and adrenaline for doing that. Um, so the uh, sympathetic nervous system um, really is this is this system throughout the body, not just at the, in the pelvis, but throughout the body that sort of ramps everything up and gets everything on high alert, you know. And um, one of the things that happens is that sometimes uh, areas of the body are on much higher alert than they need to be, um, that they have a very difficult time relaxing, uh, that the nerves get very aggravated and irritated and hypersensitive and hyper irritable. Um, and therefore, the, the, the idea is to do a local anesthetic block to quiet down that nerve uh, irritability. Uh, and, uh, and really that's done typically under fluoroscopic guidance. Fluoroscopy is like x-ray up on a big uh, computer screen uh, so that the physician can see exactly where the bony landmarks are, exactly where the tip of the needle is, uh, and place the local anesthetic uh, or other medication, sometimes corticosteroid, anti-inflammatory as well, um, locally at that spot. Um, and, uh, and for many, many patients, they can have profound relief uh, of their coccyx pain and to some extent uh, other pelvic floor pain syndromes as well. Um, in terms of um, longer term, um, one of the things is that the uh, often once you break that cycle, even though the local anesthetic itself, for example, um, chemically is only lasting for a matter of hours, just like if you go home from the dentist and your cheek is numb for a few hours, um, but for these pain fibers, these, uh, these sympathetic nervous uh, system fibers that are you know, uh, you know, carrying these pain signals, uh, that once you break that cycle, often the patients will have you know, very uh, you know, profound and sustained relief you know, beyond the, the duration of the anesthetic itself. Uh, so we're talking you know, 10 months, a year, two years, three years. I've had patients who've come back you know, seven or 10 years after, a, after an injection and we're doing fine until something else flared it up. So of course, the vari there's variability from patient to patient. Uh, like any treatment, no, pa no uh, treatment is 100% uh, you know, uh, relief in 100% of the patients, um, but many patients find it very, very helpful. Um, in terms of side effects, the most common thing is soreness at the injection site for a few days, typically less than a week. Uh, and that's just from the fullness typically of the medication that's given. Um, and really for safety purposes, it just needs to be given under typically um, fluoroscopic guidance. Um, oh, and the one other thing I'll mention is then if you quiet things down and you have that patient uh, have a lot of um, you know, relief of their sympathetic nervous system hyperactivity, that may be a very good time to dovetail with pelvic floor physical therapy because now the patient may be much, may be much better able to tolerate uh, the pelvic floor uh, PT uh, in that area. All right, um, is it safe to remove your piriformis muscles? Um, all things are relative when it comes to surgery, of course. Yeah, so um, the piriformis muscles are, are uh, basically are muscles that go diagonally across the, uh, across the buttock. The uh, piriformis starts uh, in front of the sacroiliac joint, 
um, and swings down uh, diagonally across the buttock and goes you know, over to the lateral hip region, over by the uh, greater trochanteric region. Uh, maybe I can show that I can show that one better on this model here. Um, so basically, you know, from the sacroiliac joint, you know, in front of that, and coming over towards the trochanter, you know, so sort of, uh, you know, kind of uh, along like that, roughly. Um, and basically, um, so removing the piriformis, um, you know, is sort of a um, is sort of a um, approach of last resort. Uh, so if um, so, most patients will respond well for piriformis muscle pain to uh, physical therapy and local injections. Um, certainly, far less than one percent of patients with piriformis problems need surgical removal. Um, but I guess, as with all things, you know, there's no patients that get you know, uh, you know, there's no condition where 100 percent of patients get relief from. Uh, uh, you know, from pelvic floor PT or injections. Um, so there may be some, there may be very, very rare isolated instances where removing a, the piriformis may be necessary. Um, and it would need to be done by a surgeon who's skilled at performing uh, the surgery in that area, definitely, um, if it was to be performed at all. Um, because the, remember the sciatic nerve, which is the primary nerve going down into the leg, it splits into the tibial uh, and peroneal nerves. Um, the majority of your leg is innervated by, by that sciatic nerve. Um, so you definitely want to make sure that the surgeon, uh, if you are having surgery in that area, is extremely cautious about preserving the sciatic nerve. All right, someone here says, um, I had uh, horrible tailbone pain for a year. Now I have x-rays, CT, MRI, pelvic floor physical therapy, venography, everything comes back normal. Um, I know the tailbone has something to do with my chronic pain. It hurts to sit especially in a car, what can I do next as far as uh, more testing? Again, I would say the one thing that you haven't mentioned is uh, what I mentioned earlier, which is the sitting versus standing x-rays. And again, with that, um, it is very, very common, uh, again, that we see patients who've had x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, uh, et cetera, that all look normal in and of themselves. Um, but in, pa in uh, you know, patients who, uh, like the individual uh, who posted here, uh, the question says, but my pain is when I'm sitting, um, then ideally the x-ray should be done uh, while sitting and compare that with while standing uh, to see if there is that uh, hypermobility. Uh, would you recommend to remove an unstable coccyx? Can you stabilize it surgically? Can pelvic floor physical therapy help? Um, so um, if the coccyx is unstable, which is one of the most common causes of coccyx pain, um, you really can't stabilize it surgically. There's, I think, a single case report, uh, you know, from overseas where they um, where they tried putting, you know, some uh, you know some surgical pin or screw in, um, but that's very very challenging. I'm gonna let me just grab a model again, um, because typically if this was, you know, if I fractured my uh, if I fractured my forearm here. Um, you know, or uh, or I had uh, instability at my wrist, at my scaphalunate joint, or you know something. Um, we could, you know, we could basically, uh, you know, we could basically put hardware across a fracture site. You know, we could put a plate with screws on each side or external fixators. Uh, you know, if I fractured my hip, we could put a rod through the, you know, through the bone. Um, and basically, those are large bones that can, uh, that have the. Um, enough bony girth or strength to, um, to be able to, to fix a, a screw uh, into them. Um, at the tailbone, you know, these are small, you know, fragile bones. If you think about it, the coccyx is about, you know, uh, you know, a little over half the size of my pinky. These are small bones. Um, if a surgeon was to try to, uh, to stabilize that by putting a screw or a rod uh, or plates there, um, it really just becomes a matter of you know, they'll, you know, the, even during surgery, surgeons will tell you, you know, the bones are often crumbling as they're, as they're taking them out to some extent because they're very small and friable. Um, so they tend not to be able to um, be stabilized from a surgical uh, perspective. The other thing is, um, if you think about it, uh, for people with tailbone pain who are having pain while they're sitting, if you were to put, you know, pins and screws and rods and plates, that, those kinds of anatomic hardware there, then when they go to sit, they would essentially be sitting on those pins and screws or rods and plates, uh, so that would be um, problematic. Um, so typically for uh, instability, it's a matter of quieting down the pain, which is done with local injections uh, under fluoroscopic guidance, targeted specifically to the uh, unstable joint uh, as determined by the sitting versus standing x-rays. 
Uh, the other part of the question here, can pelvic floor physical therapy help? Pelvic floor physical therapy absolutely can help if there's a, a lot of associated pelvic floor muscle um, pain and spasm, which in many cases uh, there is. Um, it's very difficult for the pelvic floor PT um, to, uh, to strengthen the muscles in a way that, uh, that hold things in place. Um, there's no muscle tissue behind the coccyx. There are, muscle, there are muscles that insert at the front and, and, uh, and uh, lower tip and at the sides. Um, and if somebody's ha if there's tailbone is being pulled forward a lot, there are uh, potentially ways that the pelvic floor PT can help with stretching and relaxing those muscles uh, to help with that component. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, please stick to the thread, okay? I will try. Uh, everyone, uh, everyone stick to the thread. Oh, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's for other people. Maybe that's not for me. Or maybe I was going off on a tangent. Either way, uh, I hope it's been helpful. Uh, I have a symptomatic, uh, someone says, I have a symptomatic Tarlov cyst, um, uh, S123, sacral nerve roots, placing pressure on the sacrum and coccyx, likely responsible for rectal pain. One large cyst, uh, Tarlov cyst at S2. Uh, and uh, three centimeters causing bone erosion. Do you have treatments for Tarlov cysts, non-surgical solutions? All right, so basically for those who, uh, who are not familiar, uh, Tarlov cyst, T-A-R-L-O-V, cyst, um, it's basically a cyst is a, uh, is a collection of fluid. Um, so, uh, so basically what happens is that um, within the spine, um, we, have our, we have our spinal canal uh, going down the, the middle of the spine. Um, and our cerebral spinal fluid is in there, our spinal cord is in there, the initial parts of the spinal nerves as they're exiting from the spinal cord are within, are within that uh, column of fluid, of cerebral spinal fluid. And that column of fluid goes all the way from, goes all around through our brain. We, our cerebral spinal fluid is bathing our brain. So if I, you know, shake my head or bump it, you know, that I have a little bit of fluid cushioning around my brain so it doesn't bump into the side of, uh, the inside of my, the wall of my skull. Uh, but that spinal fluid comes all the way down uh, through this, you know, through the upper part of the sacrum, um, and it typically ends uh, uh, around the mid sacrum. The spinal fluid itself does uh, does not go all the way down to the coccyx. Um, but in that upper part of the sacrum, often what can happen is that there's an outpouching of the fluid, um, and uh, it's a it's in the sacral region, so it'll be referred to as a sacral cyst. Uh, a cyst again is that you know little bag of fluid. Almost think about like a little water balloon. Uh, where the comparison that I that I make sometimes in describing a Tarlov cyst for um, for patients is if you think about a garden hose, and you ever see a garden hose where there's a little bit of a bulge in the hose, uh, you know where the wall got a little bit weaker and there's a little bit of a bulge or outpouching. That's sort of what a Tarlov cyst is, where uh, instead of it being you know water in the garden hose, it's cerebrospinal fluid, um, you know within the uh, you know within the dora and other uh, linings that are around the spinal fluid. So, the, in terms of Tarlov cysts being symptomatic, um, they can be, but the vast majority of times they are not. Um, notice I'm not saying that they're never symptomatic or that they're always symptomatic. It's that they are rarely symptomatic, but in some patients, absolutely, they can be. Um, so, um, so then it really becomes a matter of seeing, is the Tarlov cyst causing your pain or not? Um, and um, I do have an article that I wrote uh, on this, which is uh, available. It's free. It's on, uh, it's on my uh, website. Um, so if you go to tailbonedoctor.com forward slash blog, B-L-O-G, um, and again, in that search box in the upper uh, right-hand corner there, uh, if you put in the term Tarlov, T-A-R-L-O-V, um, and hit, and hit uh, search, um, it will pull up an article on how to distinguish whether your tailbone pain is coming from a Tarlov cyst versus coming from a problem specifically locally at the coccyx. Uh, there are things you can look for by your history and physical examination um, that can help to, uh, to tease that out for you. Um, and be, and the, the majority of Tarlov cysts that we see on MRI or CT scans um, do not need uh, any treatment whatsoever because, you know, probably more than 99% of them are not symptomatic. However, um, you may be the less than 1% that your Tarlov cyst is symptomatic. Um, and if so, uh, there are treatments uh, available for that. Uh, and, um, and basically, uh, a lot of times that comes down to uh, surgical treatment. There's not really a good um, injection treatment from my standpoint or physical therapy treatment that's going to um, uh, fix a Tarlov cyst uh, if it's truly symptomatic and if it's compressing onto a nerve root. Uh, you mentioned it causing bone erosion, um, but then it would be a matter of if you had pain in that area, 
Uh, more concerning, frankly, is if, there's, uh, if it's compressing into a nerve root and causing neurologic deficits. Um, in those cases, it's typically um, surgical solution, and it's typically that's a neurospine, uh, a neurosurgeon spine. Um, let's see, um, what other questions are there here? Uh, if a patient has a fall onto the coccyx, it can take nine to 12 months for full healing uh, to return uh, you know, with or without treatment. Um, it is true that tailbone pain can be notoriously chronic. Uh, and, uh, and long lasting. Um, so, and a number of the reasons for that, for lots of areas in the body, if we, you know, if I sprain my ankle or if I, you know, if I fracture or sprain my wrist, I can put it in a brace, I can put it in a cast, I can put my arm in a sling, I can use crutches so I'm not putting weight onto my ankle, you know, whatever the problem is, there's a, there's, for most areas, there's a way to use bracing uh, and uh, to stabilize the area and to offload the area. But, at the pelvis, there's no way you can put a, a brace or a sling or a cast on the tailbone just because of anatomically, you know, where it's located. Uh, and there's no way to give it a great rest either um, other than not sitting. Um, but it's very, very difficult to go, you know, I could go for, um, you know, six weeks without using my hand if I fractured it and had to have it in a cast. Or I could go for, you know, six weeks, you know, non-weight bearing on my ankle by using, uh, you know, crutches. Um, but it would be very, very challenging in modern society to go six weeks without sitting on your tailbone for, you know, just as a comparison. Um, so in those cases, the tailbone does not really get a chance to rest and heal and recover the way that a lot of other areas uh, could. And uh, tailbone pain can be notoriously chronic uh, and, uh, and persistent in that way. And then when it's, uh, the longer it's been going on, then the nerve fibers get irritated. And then we're back to talking about that sympathetic nervous system pain that gets revved up um, and often can, uh, can need, uh, you know, focal treatment for that as well. All right, scrolling down here, it says, um, all right, this is a long one, so I'm going to try to uh, scan through it. Uh, it's about pudendal neuralgia, pelvic mesh, um, basically using a Medtronic stimulator for bladder uh, and bowel leakage. Uh, it didn't help. Are there any other implants uh, for pain specifically? Um, so basically, in terms of some of the implants um, that are used for pain management, by implants, uh, they're talking about things that are either um, stimulators or ways of delivering medication. Um, so for example, there are um, spinal cord stimulators that will um, you know, that will have leads, the little uh, electrodes coming uh, to a given area. Um, and uh, in, in those cases, the leads can be placed at areas um, corresponding to where your pain is coming from. Um, and that can be one approach towards, um, you know, towards trying to relieve um, pain uh, in that area um, by, doing, by using spinal cord stimulators. Um, other, type, uh, you know, other types of implantables are things like morphine pumps and things along those lines. Um, again, you know, those are um, the stimulators and the, and the uh, medication pumps, which is an indwelling device that delivers um, uh, you know, opioid or other pain medications uh, you know, right at the level of the spine. Um, rather than taking it by mouth, um, you know, those are used in a small percentage of patients uh, when really they've exhausted uh, other, other treatment options. All right, let me see the next question here. It says, my doctor told me I have pelvic muscle spasm causing my coccyx to be pulled out of alignment. Absolutely, that can happen. He proposes Botox injections to the levator ani obtur and obturator muscles as some, uh, plus some kind of coccyx treatment. What do you think of... Uh, of injections uh, you know, for uh, coccyx and pelvic and rectal pain. Um, absolutely, there are some patients where those, uh, where those approaches may be helpful, um, you know, particularly if they're having a lot of muscle spasm. Um, again, some of those, uh, some of those uh, muscles that we, uh, that we mentioned uh, earlier um, and, uh, and as mentioned here, um, and in those cases, it may be indeed helpful to, um, you know, to do local uh, injection treatment uh, for them or injection treatment in combination with uh, pelvic floor physical therapy so that if the injection can give relief of the pain. Um, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's of course on a, on a case by case uh, basis. Uh, let's see. If an injection of anesthetic or steroid in the tailbone did not help, can I still get a ganglion impar block? Um, absolutely, if, uh, if that's appropriate. And for many, many patients it is. I would say the majority of patients who come to see me, um, and again, I've seen a, a few thousand patients with coccidinia just running a coccyx pain center you know, for roughly 20 years now. Um, you know, 
patients, about a third of my patients fly in uh, to see me and most all of those have had some form of injection before. Uh, but the most common thing is that they usually have not had a specific diagnosis to, uh, to figure out why they're having the pain. So the injections often were not individualized for, the given, for a given patient. Um, and um, so often, you know, doing a ganglion and par injection uh, often can be a helpful component if a local steroid injection um, did not help. Um, and again, I can't say whether it would help or be recommended in this particular patient, you know, um, because that would be something, as with any of the things we're talking about here, you know, would be things to talk about with your in-person treating physician. Um, should I still get sit-stand MRI even though my tailbone pain started seven weeks ago without an injury? Um, so um, typically the sit-stand uh, imaging studies are the sit-stand x-rays. Um, typically an MRI, um, the, is, if an MRI is done at all, it's usually done while you're laying down. It is possible to get a seated MRI, uh, but the sitting MRI typically has a, um, has a lower quality of the magnet, um, and that's just a function of the sitting MRI is done what's called an open MRI, which is helpful for people who have claustrophobia, um, but the... Um, the problem is that the magnet for an open MRI is weaker. It's not as strong of a magnet, so you do not get as good of an image uh, you know, when, you're doing the, um, when you're doing a seated MRI, um, typically. Um, usually with a, with a properly done uh, sitting versus standing x-ray, you can answer that question by comparing the position of the tailbone while the person is standing with the position while they're sitting um, to make that assessment. Um, so that certainly can be uh, helpful. And even whether your pain started with an injury or without an injury, uh, the ligaments can wear down gradually over, t over time and cause the instability. Uh, next question here, what causes itching, burning in, uh, in the intergluteal cleft over the sacrum and coccyx? Anytime somebody's telling me about itching, I always think about, is there any oozing at the area from something like a pilonidal cyst? Uh, and again, there's an article on my blog, you know, so tailbonedoctor.com forward slash blog. And then in the search box, if you put in um, pilonidal, P-I-L-O-N-I-D-A-L, pilonidal cyst, um, you know, C-Y-S-T, um, it'll talk about differentiating between uh, if someone has a pilonidal cyst. Um, someone's saying that they are six foot eight, but there's nothing else in the question there. So I would say that you're too very tall. Um, someone says, Dr. Foy, you're amazing. Well, thank you. I'm not six foot eight though. Uh, if your tailbone hurts more while laying down than, uh, than sitting, what would this indicate? Um, so that would be, um, that would be probably in less than 5% of patients with isolated coccyx pain, that their pain is worse while they're laying down. Because again, um, you know, compared to when you're sitting while you're laying down, Again, we'll do, you know, here's the, you know, if this is the mattress that you're sitting on, while you're laying down, you can see that most of the pressure is on the sacrum, um, whereas while you're sitting, most of the pressure is, you know, is here on the coccyx. Um, so, um, so then basically you'd need to think, is this pain coming from the sacrum, um, you know, rather than the coccyx? Um, imaging studies would be helpful. Pain that people have while at night, if pain's waking you up at night, um, you know, some uh, studies and physicians will consider that to be a red flag as to whether there may be a cancer present. Um, and if so, you know, then, you know, certainly advanced imaging studies, meaning ju not just x-rays, um, but um, MRI or CT scan uh, can be very helpful. Okay, here's our uh, tall gentleman is saying he's rectal, uh, sacral, uh, coccyx pain uh, with sitting forward, you know, leaning back, static standing increases the pain, constipation, uh, rectal pressure, waking up with pain. Again, for those kinds of, uh, for the, those kinds of things, certainly you would wanna make sure that you have um, uh, appropriate imaging studies done uh, of the area, as we just mentioned. And then with um, a lot of the pain you're reporting with um, constipation, increasing the pain, um, you know, bowel movements increasing the pain, rectal pressure, uh, of course, really important to make sure that you're seeing a specialist in that area. Um, so in, uh, in my own practice, if I have patients with a lot of those types of symptoms, um, since I'm not a gastroenterologist or proctologist, uh, you know, uh, that would basically be doing uh, evaluations of the, of the rectum and the lower part uh, of, the, uh, of the gastrointestinal tract, um, really important to see a specialist uh, in that area. Uh, and they may need to do, um, you know, uh, you know, a uh, scope where they go in and look at the, at the lining inside and see if there's anything uh, causing uh, problems in that area. Um, I have seen patients with things like uh, retrorectal hematoma, which is basically um, 
I know it's a big long medical word, but basically it's just a mass. It's not a cancer, but there's a mass or tumor um, between, the, uh, between the, the rectum and the coccyx. Um, looking from the side view here, um, you know, the, this is, behind, uh, let me hold it here so you can see it better. Um, this area here is behind the patient. This area here is in the pelvis. Right in front of the sacrum and coccyx is where the rectum is located. Um, so, uh, so sometimes people with rectal problems will pre present with some sacral and coccyx pain or problems. Sometimes people with sacrum and coccyx problems will present with rectal symptoms. So the areas can be uh, tricky to discern. So it really comes down to your history, your physical exam, and then uh, often imaging studies uh, can be helpful as well. But the area I was just mentioning, which is that in between the rectum and the sacrum and coccyx, there sometimes uh, can be a mass there um, that's typically not malignant. Uh, if it's a, if it's this particular one that I mentioned, a retrorectal hematoma, um, but it's in, it's important to uh, you know to see that, and um, MRI would typically show that. Uh, someone says I have severe rectal pain, uh, plus pressure in the sacrum. Uh, MRI shows prior uh, the coccyx shows prior fi fracture with dislocation, rotation of the last sacral segment. Uh, what kind of injections do you do for coccyx, uh, for the coccyx and pain and, and rectal pain and pelvic pain? Um, again, it really depends. We'd, we would evaluate uh, each, into, each patient, of course, individually, um, localize where their pain is coming from. Sometimes, be an, uh, sometimes there may be an old area where the fracture is healed that may not be the, the most painful current site. So it's a matter of seeing what is the site where the person's pain is currently most, uh, most problematic uh, and then, uh, and then you know, figuring it out from there. Okay, let me see. Uh, thank you for answering, Dr. Foy. It was great meeting you in Tampa. Uh, yes, uh, I did. Uh, I had a uh, terrific time down in Tampa at a pelvic floor uh, physical therapy uh, conference uh, and met a wonderful bunch of um, pelvic floor physical therapists uh, down there. Uh, I'm going to say maybe two years ago now. I don't know. Time uh, time sort of flies. Um, there would be a picture of you then on my website uh, if you go to tailbonedoctor.com and put in uh, in that uh, forward slash blog and put in Tampa. Uh, there is that group photo that we took uh, in, uh, after I gave my uh, lecture on coccyx pain there. Um, let's see. Uh, can you please summarize? So I guess we're asking to sort of wrap up. It has been an hour and uh, 15 minutes roughly almost that we're going here. So uh, or an hour and 10-ish anyway. Uh, so I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to skim through the remainder of these and then um, and then kind of uh, you know summarize uh, and uh, and then what I will do on here is um, for some of these things that um, that I've mentioned links I, I can come back to the um, I can come back to this uh, you know uh, post and maybe drop in some of the responses with the uh, with the links to make it easier for people to find some of the uh, some of the resources that I mentioned earlier. Um, Someone's asking about genital arousal disorder. That's not something that I treat in my particular practice, so unfortunately I'm not able to give you much uh, expertise on that. Uh, if your tailbone hurts more lying down, that's the one we just said. Can you please summarize the test a coccyx patient should consider? Uh, can you please suggest therapies uh, or interventions you typically recommend? So I would say in terms of summarizing the test, everything in medicine typically ideally starts with a uh, careful history and physical exam. Uh, and then in terms of additional testing, the x-rays, really having the sitting versus standing x-rays done is dramatically superior to the standard uh, you know, coccyx x-rays that are done while a patient is standing up or lying down. Those sitting x-rays are absolutely crucial. Again, the problem is that most radiology centers have never heard of them, even though they have been around for uh, decades and written up in the medical literature. Uh, so uh, that's the problem. Um, for advanced imaging studies, typically it's MRI or CT scan. Um, MRI is better at showing soft tissue structure as compared with CT scan. CT scan can be helpful for showing bone, uh, MRI can show bone as well. Um, uh, CT scan does have radiation to the pelvis, um, so typically I prefer an MRI rather than a CT scan, probably you know, 98 times out of 100. Uh, and then there's just isolated times when, a, when a, a CT scan is helpful, particularly if you're worried about if the MRI was not definitive and you're worried about um, bone cancer, uh, which unfortunately can happen at the sacrum and coccyx or something called a chordoma. Uh, C-H-O-R-D-O-M-A, chordoma, and um, it is a nasty uh, malignancy that has a tendency to occur at the sacrum and coccyx and unfortunately is usually fatal uh, you know, within a few years. Um, so um, it's, uh, it's a terrible cancer as cancers go. Um, so 
Um, anyway, an MRI would be uh, typically the, the best test for that. Um, let's see, I'm scrolling through here. I think some of these I've seen already. Thanks, Dr. Foy, very informative. You are very, very welcome. Um, thanks, Dr. Foy, for this amazing Facebook Live. You're very, very welcome. Um, all right, and um, yep, so what I will do is this. Um, I will, um, and actually there's a question here, how to find a tailbone doctor in your area. I do on my uh, website actually have an article about um, how to find a local doctor, questions to ask if you call the receptionist, um, you know, if you call and ask, you know, whether the doc that doctor treats coccidinia and the receptionist, who's the person who books all of their appointments, says, coxa, what, wait, what is the thing? You know, then probably they, um, they're not, um, you know, they're uh, probably not treating much coccyx pain. Um, so basically, um, I have a, if, you know, uh, I have an article on that. In fact, I'll uh, come back uh, probably tomorrow if I get if I can um, and post the link to um, you know to that article can uh, can be helpful for that. Uh, someone's asking what insurances I accept. The uh, best way uh, to find out the specifics uh, because there's a, no, a, no, a number of them um, would be to um, uh, just call my office 973-972-2802, and they'll be able to give you a, a current list uh, of those. Um, but I am, I do, you know, the, uh, the medical school and my practice here, uh, does accept Medicare, uh, also Medicaid for all of the New Jersey Medicaid, uh, programs, charity care, uh, our hospital here is the number one provider of charity care in the state of New Jersey, uh, for individuals that, uh, that do not have, um, insurance or resources or those kinds of things. Uh, and again, Medicaid programs and a number, and a number of, uh, private insurance carriers as well. But again, the best way is just to call the office and they'll know. Uh, the specifics uh, better than I will actually, um, and then uh, and then the, someone dropped in the the link here as well. Um, so um, let's do this. I think I'm going to um, wrap things up. Just uh, we've been going for a while. Um, my throat maybe uh, is getting a little dry. So so uh, I really appreciate uh, the invitation to have uh, you know uh, done this Facebook Live session. Uh, I enjoy you know uh, you know sharing educational information. Um, for those who may just be tuning in, a couple of things I will point out. Um, the uh, if you want a free copy of the the book Tailbone Pain Relief Now, um, you can get that on Amazon. And for today and tomorrow, so March seventh and eighth, uh, two thousand and nineteen, um, you can get that um, uh, on Amazon. The ebook, the electronic book version of that, is free. Um, so I just uh, I had the Amazon make it free, sort of in uh, honor to match the timing of uh, of doing this Facebook Live, um, so that if people had questions and wanted to get more information, you can get the entire. Um, you know, if you're interested enough in the tailbone to read uh, 272 pages all about the coccyx, uh, then this is the book for you. Um, but basically, um, that's on there for you. Um, and uh, so that's number one as far as the book. If you're interested in um, in coming to see me, or you know, you can. Uh, find my website, which is uh, www.tailbonedoctor.com, uh, or I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of free information on, uh, on the website there as well, uh, lots of articles uh, that I've written over the years. Um, I also have a lot of uh, free YouTube videos, uh, so countless hours and hours and hours of uh, videos over the last, uh, I don't know how many years, umpteen years, uh, on uh, tailbone pain. So for that, it's, uh, my YouTube channel is called Tailbone Pain Doctor. Uh, or if you just search for tailbone pain and my last name, which is Foy, F-O-Y-E, which, uh, you know, then, um, then, you know, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll find me on there somewhere. Um, so again, I want to thank everyone for, uh, for joining in. Um, this, I assume this will be for those who may have joined late. Um, the entire video should be up live there. Uh, and uh, I assume, uh, for reference for people who want to, uh, to watch it later and, uh, and I'll respond to some of the comments in there, uh, so that uh, I can drop in some of the links for some of the things that I mentioned. So, all right. Thanks everybody. And, uh, have a good night and, uh, wishing you all the best. Bye-bye now.